we have a few rules to look at that aren't that well known, so I want, I want to make sure I leave you with some understanding of them. And we've got a couple cases. Uh, but the rules are Rule 66, which we looked at at one point earlier when we did the Republic of the Philippines case. Um, rule 66 is about a receiver. But we're looking at these rules a little differently today because we don't often focus on uh, what you can do either post-judgment, and that's principally what we're looking at today, post-judgment remedies with the civil case. Um, in, in essence, how, how do you collect when you've got a civil judgment? Um, and the defendant is either continuing to refusing to pay even despite a judgment, or there are insufficient uh, insurance policies available to satisfy whatever your judgment has. And now you're looking at trying to decide how you're going to move forward and um, reduce that judgment to cash. Uh, frankly, by the way, this is something you really need to think about at the time you take the case. You don't wait till you've got your judgment and then say, okay, now how am I going to collect it? Um, the fact is, is that this is part of your investigation at the outset of the case is because what the case is worth in part is, well, what assets or insurance policies are they're going to be ultimately available to help satisfy um, any judgment you obtain. And, and there will be cases where you might have uh, incredible damages, but you have a defendant who doesn't have assets, isn't likely to have assets, doesn't have sufficient insurance, or will never have sufficient insurance to cover these losses. And so then the case is worth what you can get. And so there will be cases uh, that you have to evaluate that even despite incredible liability um, evidence, despite incredible evidence with respect to damages, um, the case may be worth nothing in the long haul simply because uh, there are problems with respect to trying to satisfy any potential judgment. But Rule 66 is about receivers. Um, when, and we're going to look at the case, but when there is a judgment, and that means you've got an execution. Oftentimes, once you have an execution against a company or an individual, um, you might make demand upon it, have the sheriff take it and tell the person, okay, here's the judgment for X number of dollars, you must pay me. Oftentimes, the demand uh, goes uh, unheard. Uh, and now we've got a judgment for a lot of money, or a little bit of money, but we don't have cash. One way for, uh, and usually this is used with respect to corporations, is Rule 66. Rule 66 allows you to bring a, another civil action and ask that the court appoint a receiver over the corporate, usually it's a corporation, that entity. And what the receiver has the power to do, and we saw it in the Republic of the Philippines, we're going to see it again tonight, it, it is called an extraordinary remedy. But the, and the reason it is is because the receiver actually takes control of the corporation, ousts whoever the operating officers are of the um, entity, and in fact uh, replaces uh, whatever the governing body may be, and has the ability to uh, not only pay the judgment, but if it's necessary to liquidate the assets of the corporation or the entire corporation to satisfy that judgment, then the receiver may do so. And, and so it is one of the most effective remedies against a corporation that continues to refuse to pay an outstanding judgment. And it may be that they're just not refusing, but they don't have the cash or any ability to get access to it. Well, then that means that the corporation might be, have to be liquidated to do it. The court's not going to generally allow an appointment of a receiver pre-judgment, so you've got to obtain a judgment. Oftentimes, they're going to want to have seen that you've done something to try and satisfy that judgment. Um, either by way of uh, demand upon it or look at other options. And we're going to look at Rule 69 in a minute for discovery with respect to uh, another post-judgment remedy. Um, but the receiver does have the ability to satisfy the judgment. And if the corporation can get access to any uh, funds, the likelihood is they're going to try and oppose the receiver to, and satisfy your judgment. Receiver has to be appointed. It's a superior court remedy in Massachusetts. District courts can't appoint receivers. It, again, this is an equitable remedy, which means we're almost always looking at a superior court action. Uh, and then the receiver, obviously, at some point accounts for what he or she has done, can, uh, is entitled to a fee for their services as well. And um, that's uh, Rule 66. Sometimes a receiver is appointed to comply with other orders of the court, as we saw in the Republic of the Philippines, where they were looking at um, 
uh, paying the mortgages while the case was pending for these buildings in New York. And then at some point, the court determined that they'd call that a special property advisor since it was prejudgment. But a receiver can also be appointed to carry out orders of the court. I think, if memory serves right, when the Boston Harbor was, uh, they were trying to clean it up and remove a lot of the pollu pollution sources, there was a receiver appointed by the court to carry out the court's orders uh, to try and make it comply with the various environmental laws that, that, that were an issue. Uh, so sometimes a receiver is appointed to c carry out other orders of the court, but from the post-judgment remedy standpoint, what we look at as receivers is, is in essence trying to satisfy an outstanding judgment where the corporation refuses to comply. Questions on Rule 66? Yep. The receiver is kind of like the bankruptcy, bankruptcy trustee. Yeah, I, I think you could, uh, you could look at it that way that in essence it has those types of powers to marshal assets, to run the corporation in the interim, and to potentially liquidate the corporation if that's what uh, is best in order to satisfy the potential uh, claimants and the like. And, and it is a non-bankruptcy proceeding, uh, but that's, I think that's a very fair way to look at it. When Springfield went into receiver? Did they appoint a receiver in Springfield as well? I think they did. So did the state go to court to have one appointed over the yep. state? Yeah, it can, it, can be, it can be done, again, because what you're saying is the entity is, is not doing something that either the court has ordered or that is appropriate to do. Uh, sometimes you see them in the housing cases, too, where the housing authority refuses to desegregate or comply with other orders, so the court will appoint a receiver to take control over the entity and to do what is lawful. Um, so it, it is what we call an extraordinary remedy because it displaces the actual authority the power to run that organization otherwise because the receiver takes complete control over the entity. So it's an extraordinary remedy, but the fact is whether it's an order from the court to desegregate or to stop polluting or to clean up the Boston Harbor, or it's a judgment that has remained unpaid, a judgment is also an order of the court, um, the court at some point has to step in. It's not going to be the first resort, but it is a very, very powerful remedy to help you satisfy outstanding judgments. Um, and and it, oftentimes it's something you're going to need to do um, because there will be some defendants that the fact is most of us think, oh my God, I've got an execution, I've got a judgment. So there will be some that are going, they're robbing Peter to pay Paul anyway. Um, squeaky wheel gets the grease. You, you've got to put, continue to put pressure on because whoever's the last man is getting nothing. Um, you've got to push harder and faster and try to, to put the pressure on because otherwise, um, you're going to end up with nothing, uh, potentially. By the way, again, go back to something I said to begin with. This is an investigation you need to do at the outset of the case. You need to figure out where the assets are. If there's real estate that the entity owns that you're suing, then we're going to look at an attachment under Rule 4 in the digital equipment case. Because you need to preserve assets while your case is pending. It is vitally important to think about preserving your place in line because your case may take a couple of years to wind its way through. Oftentimes, you're not the only person chasing that entity. Oftentimes, you're trying to figure out who might be in line ahead of you and who's going to try and jump in behind you. So preserving your, your place, because whether your client is paying you hourly or you're working on a contingent fee basis, I don't want to be paying you a whole bunch of money hourly up front and then find two years later, after having spent God knows how many tens of thousands of dollars, I'm not getting anything. On the other hand, on the same hand, you don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on a contingent case, putting hours and hours in with the expectation that you're going to get a big chunk of change at the end and find out that, yeah, you've got your first million dollar judgment, a big deal, you've tried the case, you want a million dollar case, and you're getting nothing. Um, and if you haven't either gotten an attachment to preserve assets while the case is pending or you can't find assets now, um, you're going to be out. I told you. We had someone bring us a, a case after the fact. They've got a judgment. They had a judgment for, this was nearly 30 years ago, for three quarters of a million dollars on a, a guy uh, sued a ladder company. You make defective ladders, you don't stay in business that long, and that's what this company did. Guy was terribly injured, but by the time they came to us, they had a judgment for $750 plus thousand dollars, but insurance policies were gone, companies long gone, He's got a worthless piece of paper. 
Um, and that's too bad because my guess is, A, there were policies at one point. You, there would have to be some policies to cover the manufacturing of the product. And B, there probably was a manufacturing facility um, that, you know, again, grab it when you begin the case. Not, don't look at the end of the case, how am I going to satisfy the judgment? Because again, you don't want to spend a thousand hours or two thousand hours on a case and find out there's no money there for you anyway. Um, so it, it, it's important to start to think about that from the outset. Uh, I've settled cases early simply because, real early, um, because there's no insurance, there's no assets, there's never likely to be. And might as well move on, get them what they can, and not waste a lot of money in the process. Um, you got to be certain, though, by the way, that there never will be money. Uh, but there are some situations where it's pretty clear that that's true. Rule 69 is another rule that people do not know much about. Uh, and I, want, I think it's important that you know about it. As a general matter, during discovery in a civil case, you can't ask questions about assets, bank accounts, real estate that someone might own, because it's not within the scope of discovery while the initial case is proceeding, right? The scope of discovery under Rule 26 is anything that's relevant or that which will lead to relevant evidence. If it's a car accident case, if it's a med mal case, if it's a simple business dispute between two entities, where I have my money, what money I might have, what real estate I might own is completely irrelevant to the cause of action. Simply is. If you ask, you won't get, I won't give it to you. There's no reason. It's not within the scope of discovery. You don't have the right to know where my bank accounts are and how much I have until you establish your right to the judgment. And that's only going to come either through trial or summary judgment when you obtain a judgment. So while in many ca in cases in the initial phase of discovery, during while we're arguing liability and damages, you can ask about available insurance policies, and obviously should. You cannot ask those other questions about assets and where they may be located and what they are. They're not relevant. Once you get a judgment, it is. But here's, here's part of the problem. Well, now the case is over. I've got a judgment. What process is there to sort of go backwards in time to now do a deposition or send out interrogatories or things like that about assets now? Where do you have bank accounts? How much money do you have in the bank account? Where do you have for real estate? How much money, uh, how much money is your real estate worth? Um, you name it when you start to think about assets. Where are your cars? Uh, how much cash does the business generate on a weekly basis? But uh, if, if you're thinking of attachment, do you want to know all that information before the judgment? Uh, y you should, but I want to go back to attachment because this is, this is different. This is Rule 69 where I don't know about assets. What Everell's talking, let me just finish this piece and then I'll come back, then I'll go over to Rule 4.1 for attachments. What th this we're talking about in 69 is where I don't, I don't either, well, for two things. Either I have some information about assets but not enough, or I simply want to know more. I, I, and I want you to answer under oath these questions, right? I want you to answer under oath where your bank accounts are, what your potential inheritances are, whatever it is. And, and Rule 69 allows you to do that just in the same way you would obtain discovery otherwise that's relevant. Rule 69B, uh, 69A2. You can do a deposition, you can send out interrogatories. The problem comes in is, well, what if they don't answer them? What if they don't show up for the deposition? Well, deposition with a subpoena, I can try contempt. If it's interrogatories, it's not going to do much good if they don't answer them. But it's a relatively cheap way to start the process. Um, if it was a sufficient judgment, I'd probably go right to the deposition with a subpoena, ask them to bring various records with them, and then take a, hopefully, figure out where the assets may be. That's Rule 69, and that's, that's a rule that allows you to do this, uh, and there will be times where you may have to use this, uh, but it is a post-judgment remedy. Now let's talk about Everill's point, which is really Rule 4.1, which is the digital equipment case. 66, 69, was there one other rule that was supposed to be? I thought there were three. 68. Oh, 68, thank you. Uh, rule 68, another little known and little used rule. Rule 68 is a rule that allows a defendant to make what's known as an offer of judgment. 
An offer of judgment is, can be made at, at the minimum 14 days prior to trial. And what the defendant is hoping is to make the plaintiff think a little harder about whether going forward. In essence, you say, I will agree that a judgment for X number of dollars can be entered against me. If the plaintiff rejects that offer, or simply doesn't respond, if you don't respond, you reject the offer. And the plaintiff ultimately obtains less than that judgment amount, then costs can be assessed against the plaintiff. Costs should be assessed. The costs from that point forward are the plaintiff's responsibility. So two things can happen. You can cut off the plaintiff's right to get their own costs, and you can then tax them with whatever costs that you've incurred as a result of them not uh, accepting an offer that, in, that, at, the, at, that at least by trial uh, standards, because you got less, was a reasonable offer. There's some argument that those costs can include attorney's fees. This, the rule simply says costs. It doesn't say attorney's fees. I think your argument is strengthened when the various statutes that might be involved with the plaintiff's using talk about attorney's fees. But more often than not, we're talking about costs. But the cost of a deposition can be $1,000 or $2,000. The cost of producing experts, those costs can add up. The normal court costs, the filing fee, the service fee, we're talking about relatively short money. But to the extent that we can tax some of these other costs on about depositions and the like, and you can, then that can make the plaintiff rethink whether they have some risk in going forward, which is always a good thing. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, in terms of receivers, does that, receiverships, yep. does that just uh, for corporations or does it apply to smaller companies? When I say small companies, I mean something like a close held corporation or something. Well, any corporation. I mean, any, any corporation it applies to. The question would be, well, can it apply to other, you know, DB individuals? Everald Henry doing business as Everald's Auto Body. Um, there's an argument that it could. There are other remedies against the individual that may be more effective. Uh, but the argument could be even non-corporations, the, uh, the, you can take control over the entity. But it doesn't need to be a publicly traded corporation. More often than times, it's not. It's a relatively small corporation. The individuals are insulated from liability because they're officers of the corporation and the like. Well, we now need to liquidate the corporation, or at least threaten to liquidate and potentially liquidate in order to satisfy the judgment. So it can be a, applied to any entity. More often than not, we're, we're looking at not publicly traded corporations, because usually they have access to this money. OK? Um, so Rule 68, arguably, the, well, it says 14 days prior to trial. The sooner you make it, the better, because more costs will add up if you do it early on. And I don't know why it's not used more, because you could really even lowball an offer through an offer of judgment. Uh, so I'll offer you five grand. I, you know, you're asking 300,000. Offer you five grand through an offer of judgment. If I get a defense verdict, you owe all the costs. Um, now, obviously, that's not enough to make someone think hard about whether they want to settle or not. Uh, but there is probably a number where that conversation has to become a lot more serious between the plaintiff and the plaintiff's lawyer if, if in fact, there's a real concern that, A, the number is not a bad number, all in all, or, B, we might get a defense verdict here. Because that means the plaintiff has to think about potentially paying costs. And so Rule 68 should be used more often. Um, there's one other uh, downside to it uh, that I want you to understand, because I, I saw it over here. Uh, in Methuen. If a defendant makes an offer of judgment, and in Methuen they did it, I forget which case it was, um, but they made an offer of judgment, and I think it was $200,000 in a civil rights case or a sex harassment case. I forget which one it was, but because I've had a few like that. Um, and the plaintiff says, I accept. Well, in that situation, I don't think it's even an argument that if, in fact, the plaintiff is successful in obtaining a judgment for 200000 that triggers, on either a harassment claim or a civil rights claim, that triggers that they're the successful litigant and now are entitled to pursue attorney's fees as well. And so I think in, 
uh, that was misused because I don't think in making the offer they thought through the ramifications of, in essence, confessing to the judgment, agreeing that a judgment for X number of dollars can be obtained. In actions where the plaintiff brings an action that allows potentially the statutory award of attorney's fees to the successful litigant, you've got to be careful using a Rule 68 offer of judgment because, frankly, 200 grand plus all the attorney's fees for the last couple of years, um, that's a pretty good deal. Certainly a great deal for the attorneys because uh, the attorney's fees alone could be another couple hundred grand in, in, in a contested case. Plaintiff gets the 200 or thereabouts, less um, probably a little cut on a contingent basis. Attorney gets all the money. That's a pretty good deal. And so you've got to be careful using Rule 68 where there may be um, an argument. And it's not, I don't even think it's, I, think, I don't think it's just an argument. If, it's, if, if the claims that the plaintiff brings provide for a statutory award of attorney's fees, then the argument would then be that they're a successful litigant and can now, in addition to the 200, through the offer of judgment, petition the court for an award of attorney's fees. And that's a pretty strong argument. I don't think that, I think that's a, that, that, I think that's a winner. Okay, so you want to be careful when you use it, but I, I don't see it used enough. And I've, I've probably, I've, in all the cases I've had, I've seen it used twice. And in one of the cases, it really did cause a problem because we had, uh, it was a $50,000 offer of judgment. The insurance policy was 50. The other tort fees are, um, was likely more culpable in our mind, but it was a case that we could have tried, and the way it would work, it was just a very odd case. They could, they could say, Aaron's responsible, or Jim's responsible. The likelihood of, of a neither being responsible just wasn't not realistic at all but they could have find them jointly liable or one individually. And this was our problem in talking to the plaintiff is, Aaron wants out for 50 grand. This is a case where the jury could easily come back and say, no, Jim is 100% responsible for this, which that means then we owe Aaron her costs. She's not offering us peanuts, she's offering us 50 grand. We do have damages probably the likely to be in the three to $500,000 range at trial. Um, She's potentially getting out, and she might be the one that the jury ultimately says, no, no, it was all Aaron. Um, but the fact is, there was a greater likelihood they could come in and say, no, Aaron owes 20% of it, or Aaron owes none of it. And so it was, I thought it was, uh, it was a very smart move for them to make an offer of judgment, and it, it did place us in a position in that case. Uh, we had to make a hard call and have a hard discussion with the plaintiff as to what's likely, what we saw was likely to happen and hope that we're picking the right defendant to go all in against uh, at the end. Because it, it, it was a very unusual set of circumstances. Uh, an accident happened down the road a little bit, sent the cars into a tailspin, and one of them ended up coming into our lane, hitting us. But that person wasn't the one that originally was at fault for the first accident. And so it, it was a problem. You could see where the jury might find it was beyond her control or whatever. So there was an ex I thought it was an excellent uh, use of an offer of judgment, and I don't see it used enough. Uh, I do plaintiff's work. Uh, I, would, I would think it should be used more. Let's talk about, any questions on offers of judgment? Let's talk about rule four. Uh, and this is attachments, and this is what we're, and this, is, this will get us, this will start us with the digital equipment case as well. Um, when we begin a case, uh, we need to know how we're likely going to satisfy any potential judgment. Plus, we also want to put pressure on the defendant to think about resolving it sooner rather than later. Uh, and to the, so the, to the extent that we can take additional steps in that regard, we do. Um, you can attach, by way of court permission, virtually anything. I can attach, and most commonly pre-judgment, we're talking about real estate, okay? Post-judgment, we may want to attach your wagers, your vehicles, um, uh, you name it. Your, if you're a railroad company, your locomotives, uh, ships, boats, you name it. If I can find it and there's money there, um, we're likely going to try and get court permission to take whatever it is you've got. But pre-judgment, because the asset can't, uh, will be held for 
while the case is pending, the most common form of attachment that's granted is a real estate attachment. Because if it's personal property, we've got to take it into possession. If it's your motor vehicle, for instance, I have to take it into possession and put it in storage. Well, I don't know what, what do you figure, 30, 50 bucks? I don't even know what they charge at these tow lots now for storage. But at 30 to $50 a day, that car, over the course of a piece of litigation, is going to be worth nothing compared to the storage fees. So we don't, you don't seize and you're not likely to be obtained an order pre-judgment on personal property because both the manner in which you have to take it into possession um, and the expense with it. But real estate, if we get a real estate attachment, all that happens is the court, you, you get a, what's known as a writ of attachment. It's filed at the Registry of Deeds, assuming that's where the land is located. If it's registered land, you have to file it at the, at the land court. And that goes on file as a lien against the property. And whoever then mortgages, give, provides a mortgage subsequent to that or seeks an attachment subsequent to that, they're junior in time. Okay? If you wanted to try and sell a property, you could not sell it in all likelihood with an attachment on it because no one's going to buy it. Uh, unless they're getting clean title. So an attachment protects the equity for your client during that process. Rule 41 says the way in which you get an attachment is by bringing a motion for an attachment under Rule 4, showing that there's a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits, and that there's no, or, and that there is either no or insufficient insurance available to satisfy any potential judgment. At that point, the court can grant an attachment on the real estate. It doesn't dispossess them. It does affect their ability potentially to mortgage it or to transfer it. But there are ways in which they could even still potentially mortgage or transfer it. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. There is an argument that in order to get an attachment, you have to post a bond. The better argument is you do not. Uh, there's no reason for the bond because it really doesn't change um, the position of the defendant with respect to that real estate. They, they can't be evicted. Um, it, it does affect their rights in some ways, uh, but they're relatively limited, and it's, and it's not um, that difficult for them. Um, if you wanted to remove the attachment and weren't successful in simply arguing it, you have the defendant has the right to post a bond in essence, to bond over the attachment. So if the case is potentially worth 50 grand, they could post a bond for 50. And frankly, you don't care because now you have security. It's just in a different fashion for the judgment. So you can, you can seek to post a bond. And, and either way, the plaintiff now has his or her protection that they were seeking. OK? The other things that you might attach pre-judgment, bank accounts have to be sequestered so the, plaintiff, the defendant has no, no access to it anymore. The court's not likely to grant you that. You'd need an extraordinary reason for it. Um, and I, I, don't think, I, I don't think you're likely to be able to, to fashion it. Unless you could show that you know, it's one of these Ponzi-type schemes that we saw out uh, where they're stealing and the money's going to be gone and we've got to grab it quickly. Uh, I mean, it might be, but it, you're talking about an extraordinary request pre-judgment. Once you obtain your judgment, first let's take you obtained your judgment and you, got, you have received an attachment. If you get your judgment and you have an attachment, when you get that execution, you now have to levy that execution against the real estate at the Registry of Deeds or the Land Court. You've got to now take your judgment and file it as the additional lien against the property. And the date that you get preference for is the date that the attachment was. If you do not file your judgment, your execution against that land, and I think it's within 60 days, you lose your place in line. You lose your attachment. So it's important to then finish the process at the end of it. That execution, potentially you could sell that real estate if you ask the sheriff, instead of what we call levy and suspend. Levy and suspend the sale. So just simply put it as a lien against the real estate. Tell them to levy against the real estate and sell it. And then they would publish the notice in the newspaper, and at some point there'd be an auction, and the auction would be of your client, whoever the defendant's interest is. And that can pose a problem because they may not own the entirety of the land. Suppose it's uh, you know, uh, a couple, two people. Well, they can sell whoever the person you have the judgment against interest, but they can't sell the other. 
And obviously, if you think about that, that creates issues with respect to both, well, who the hell wants half of someone else's house? Or potentially, how do I then, I, 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 the other person still has, um, and is entitled to live in the property. Uh, are we, I guess we are, uh, tenants in common at this point. And so then you go back to all your first year property about, well, what are those rights at that point? You, you fair rental value, can I evict, can I move in? Um, but, but the fact is it's the only, it it's allows you to put pressure on it and it's not always uh, the situation where we've got these other uh, tenancies that we have to worry about uh, if you levy itself. That's why some people simply prefer to levy and suspend. If the equity is in the property, sooner or later you've got to deal with me. Uh, judgment could be running at 12% interest per year. I'm not going to get 12% of my money anywhere else. Uh, as long as you can wait and as long as you know the equity is there, sooner or later you're going to deal with me and then you, and you're going to deal with me you would, on hard terms simply because I don't have to deal now. You're selling the real estate. I've had the judgment. There's plenty of equity there to cover me. I'm going to get paid here before the day is out, and I'm going to get paid a lot more money than if you had paid me early. So the real estate attachment is the most effective way to secure your place in line, most effective way to recover your money simply because it's a significant asset. If the, um, there is a, or isn't real estate, you haven't done an attachment there, with respect to cars and bank accounts and ships and boats and locomotives or any other personal property, you now can bring a suit on that judgment and seek to attach whatever it is you're going to want to attach. Wages, there's a certain exemption each week for wages. I think it might, there might even be a $500 exemption for the value of a vehicle. Um, but the bottom line is, now you go back to court and ask for an attachment over that property. You can attach it, you can take it into possession, and then ultimately, since you've already got a judgment for a certain amount, that, that case is going to go to judgment quickly and you can dispose of the, whatever the property is and obtain satisfaction of that judgment. One last method of attachment is called a keeper attachment. A keeper attachment is also granted under Rule 4 and usually it, it deals with operating businesses. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I, I don't know, I, didn't, I should have looked it up for you. Uh, historically, a keeper attachment works with cash businesses. And, and the way it would have worked, the way it has worked historically, is uh, if a keeper is appointed, the sheriff, a marshal, or constable goes to the place of operation with a big bag and every dime that comes into the store that day goes into the bag and it's taken out of the store at the end of the day. So the keeper, the keeper keeps all the money. That's the way this works uh, until the attachment is satisfied. It's called the keeper attachment. I actually, what struck me the other day is, well, how's this work with the bank cards now? Right, because keeper historically is cash. Ar arguably checks but I just, I should have, should have started to research this a little bit because to me that's going to go directly into a bank account and in order to get access to the bank account I may need a receiver, not a keeper uh, because, I mean, it, it struck me that, because you know, you go to the coffee store, you go wherever, some of these places, there's not a lot of cash that's, that's coming in anymore, it's all bank cards and everything else. So, by the way, the keeper charges me a fee per hour for being there, so that's why I've got to know that it's going to generate sufficient cash to justify this remedy. By the way, most ongoing businesses do not want someone there dressed as a marshal or a sheriff uh, at the front of the store. It's not it tends to be bad for business, so the, it may be the threat of it and doing it is still very effective, but it did really strike me as with the bank cards, I'm, I'm not sure it's as effective of a remedy as historically it was with cash businesses. Do you have to have, you, you have, to have a sheriff there? You can just say, put in my point of sale device and swipe everything through that so it my account instead. I had never thought of that. I never thought, I, I didn't never thought of that. That would be, be right. Right. Why can't we think of a technological way to resolve this? Sure, you could, you're right. You can, use, you, can, you can use a point of sale system, but this is going right into my bank account. 
do that, you say, well, it's cash only. <laughs> you could, man. You could. You could. Uh, you know, I just haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it until I, the other day when I was thinking about this section, I said, uh, how would we actually work that? And I think either one, and you'd need authority for that, but you're right, cash only. But, you know, the cash only, I'm going to lose sales. His way, you know, here, no, we're not going to swipe it there. You're going to swipe it over here. And it all goes right into the sheriff or marshal's account. Yeah, no, no, I agree, agree. So I should, uh, I'll look that up if I can, but obviously we're not going to meet again, but it'd be at least for my own uh, satisfaction. But I do think either either, either alternative, especially uh, if, if we're thinking about trying to make sure, um, I don't think there'd be any reason not to be able to do what Matt said. I, I probably, in the motion, I would make a specific request that so, so that that form of attachment would be approved. But frankly, you would think that that would be the wiser way to do it so that for virtually any business. Well, it's, it's, okay, let's look at the digital equipment case because digital equipment brings... Uh, so you guys had any other questions on attachments? Go ahead. So can I get the elements for attachment again by chance? Yeah, it's, it's straightforward, very easy. Uh, reasonable likelihood of success on the merits. Okay. No, second one is... Um, no insurance or insufficient amounts of insurance available to satisfy any potential judgment. That's it. That's it. It's, it's really just two pieces. And if you think about it, um, what, why should there be more, right? Is that as long as I can show a reasonable likelihood of success and the potential that there is no insurance or insufficient insurance at the end of this process, um, I should be able to secure my place in line. And that's, that's all a real estate attachment does. And that's the one that's most typically granted. The personal property type attachments pre-judgment are, there will be occasions where you may not have a choice because you're worried about dissipation of assets during the pendency of litigation. But it takes an extraordinary showing to do so, simply because I, I know you got 10 grand in the bank. I want to, I want to bring an attachment over it. The way that trustee process attachment works is when I hit your bank with the writ of attachment, that 10 grand is taken out of your account and put separately. It's segregated at this point. You can't access it anymore. You can't pay your mortgage. You can't pay your car, your car bills. You can't pay. It's not your money while the case is pending. And so a court is very reluctant, obviously, to do that uh, absent an extraordinary showing because while you have a reasonable likelihood, there's no certainty that you will. And the fact is, is that you, you, until such time as there is a judgment, you, you need that money to do other things with. And so the court's reluctant on pre-judgment to, to attach personal property. What about a, an IRA? Uh, you might have a better shot. Again, you, you have a much better shot with an IRA or a 401k, simply because you shouldn't be drawing on it anyway. Yeah. However, you do have the right to, under certain circumstances and emergency situations, you have a better chance on those types of attachments uh, again, uh, on the 401 and the IRA, that wouldn't bother me. I don't want to take possession of other types of personal property during the case is pending. I told you your automobile is going to be quickly useless to me because of the storage charges. So will your boat, so will even a locomotive that could be worth you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. In, in essence, to secure that attachment, I've got to somehow take per possession of it and prohibit other people from having access to it and preserve the asset. That means I've got to have someone there with it on a regular basis. It just gets too expensive, most personal property. Uh, but, but the IRA and the 401 is probably a pretty good point if I, if I can find that. By the way, if I can find it, right? That's, you can't even get access to that information pre-judgment. And so um, it's harder to get. Digital equipment versus current. We've got a RICO action. You know, I hope you don't think of Rico any longer as just for Whitey Bulger and his group. Um, we, we plead Rico in a lot of civil cases. Uh, all it takes is two or more uh, criminal acts, wire fraud, um, you name it. And, you know, uh, most, a lot of businesses violate, not intentionally, some intentionally, violate federal statutes uh, on wire transfers, on, on you name it. Um, on, on even some of their business practices, 
that, that RICO, RICO is something we plead in civil cases, as you see it here. It doesn't take this type of malevolence that I think was present here, that, that you would be able to legitimately plead RICO in federal court. The advantage of pleading it, obviously, um, is not that this sounds sinister, is that it, it also carries with it the ability to recover attorney's fees. Um, so anytime you can bring one of those actions where the attorney's fees potentially attach uh, is a good day. Um, and it gives you additional leverage. Well, what happened here is uh, Judge Baller granted an attachment over the real estate, um, and she approved four writs of attachment, one in, uh, in the amount of 300000 against property owned by the Currys, um, and um, they then uh, sold a piece of the property and placed two checks in the amount of $1.2 and $1 million and $24,000 in escrow as prejudgment security for the plaintiff. In essence, once you have the attachment, either they're going to have to post a bond or they're going to have to provide other security. Because here, frankly, they are selling the real estate, and so precisely what the plaintiff was worried about is that somewhere down the road there will be no assets to satisfy my judgment. Um, occurs. At this point, the defendant can either post a bond or can post the security, the, the cash itself. Um, but um, what they talked about here is what the standard is. The standard's on the top of page 20. To enter an order of approval of a real estate attachment, the court, this is uh, the, the right-hand column, the court must find the existence of a reasonable likelihood that the plaintiff will recover a judgment in an amount equal to or greater than the amount of the attachment over and above any liability insurance known or reasonably known to be available. So this would also be a means of getting the defendant to produce, potentially, the insurance policies available, which would be a good thing to have. Um, you could also ask for them in discovery, but so the bringing of an attachment also would hopefully flush out what security may be available uh, for a potential judgment. And that's, in part, uh, what, what this process uh, was doing and caught them, uh, or did catch, well, catch them is probably unfair to say, but I think somewhat fair, um, that they were, in fact, transferring the property and the like. And by the way, if you could show that the property is being transferred uh, and there may not be time to provide notice, that's one of the few times where you could get an ex parte attachment, an attachment without notice. I want to remind you again the language in footnote two here. Local Rule 7.1A1. The federal courts have local rules that you have to comply with through the course of your civil actions. In state court, we, there's superior court rules, there's district court rules that are, that are in addition to the rules of civil procedure. Especially in federal court, you've got to be mindful of what those local rules are because they dictate not just font size of your pleadings and page limitations, but how you need to deal with discovery matters, how you need to deal with motions, specifically whether you have an obligation you generally do to confer and that certificate has to go into the motion, or they're just going to deny your motions if you don't comply with the local rules. So um, I left law school. Our professor never even told us about local rules. I want to make sure you understand that it's not just our little federal rules of civil procedure that we comply with in court. Oftentimes, many courts have local rules, and you, sometimes it takes a little, little longer to find them and locate them and figure out what they are and which ones are applicable. But if you don't follow the local rules, they're simply going to deny your motions. Uh, and you're going to look like you don't know what you're doing, which is, to me, even worse. So find out what other additional rules attach over and above your federal rules of civil procedure if you're in federal court. If you're in state court, over and above the state court rules of procedure, because, for instance, I assume you're aware, in Superior Court here, we have a Rule 9 process that if you want to file a motion, how that process has to work. And there are other, both Superior Court rules, Land Court rules, District Court rules, Probate and Family Court rules that have to be complied with if you're going to practice there. Okay? Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, they move forward, by the way, generally, if you're going to seek an attachment. Here they talked about the complaint was unverified. Uh, Rule 65 for injunctions requires a verified complaint, but if you're going to move for an attachment, you must have affidavits that support the attachment or a verified complaint, simply because someone's got to swear whatever it is that they're saying took place, took place, 
and what the potential damages are. So usually we would do that by way of affidavit. Um, and uh, they moved for the affidavit, they moved with the affidavits, um, and uh, at the end of the day, the court felt that they did have the ability to obtain injunctive, uh, no, I'm sorry, to obtain the attachment uh, based on the activities of the defendants here. Um, and um, they did get the opportunity to be heard, as the court felt, somewhat at length, uh, as well as provide ample information with respect to their position in the case. Um, fact is, it's a pretty straightforward uh, case to me uh, on why they should have been entitled to the attachment, um, and so therefore they did, in, in, in fact, get the attachment. Take a look at Aviation versus RSB, and this is the receiver case. This is also the case that talked about uh, Rule 69, uh, discovery in aid of the judgment. Um, and so I think it's a pretty good case that goes through uh, how that process worked here. Um, when they tried the discovery post-judgment, they got financial statements, they had a deposition. Uh, what they realized, and this is part of the problem uh, sometimes with post-judgment discovery is, um, they're going to lie about where, where the assets might be and what's available because if you tell them, they're going to come get them. Uh, the part of the problem, though, with lying about it is if it's a deposition, you're lying under oath, and if it's interrogatories, you're lying under oath. Just one is signed and the other is uh, verbal. Uh, either way, you're committing perjury, but it's very difficult to get the district attorney or someone else to act on it, but they are able to show that uh, there are assets that they're not uh, disclosing and they're not being truthful, which allows them then to go forward and get this extraordinary remedy, which is the receiver. Uh, and the receiver uh, is uh, available then uh, to take uh, complete control over the defendant uh, and find whether there's property concealed or hidden or whatever is available. Um, to be able to go forward and then to marshal those assets and potentially pay off the plaintiff. There's an argument here, it doesn't, it's not worthy of a lot of um, uh, uh, time, but there's an argument that, well, these documents are protected uh, by the Fifth Amendment. Uh, that protects testimony, uh, test, it's a testimonial privilege. It doesn't protect pre-existing documents for the most part. Uh, sometimes you could argue there's some documents, not these, that arguably might be protected under the Fifth Amendment. Again, I think this is a good case uh, because what they did try is the Rule 69 to try and obtain discovery in aid of that judgment, having been unsuccessful in getting truthful information uh, and being able to to go far enough that they could satisfy the judgment, they then went to the next step and asked for a receiver. And, and it's more likely the court is going to grant you the receiver because it's now a last resort as opposed to a first resort. Uh, and that's ultimately uh, likely, hopefully, to be able to take care of what the plaintiff feels uh, is the defendant's reluctance to pay the judgment while they may have assets somewhere hidden to satisfy it. Questions on that? I think these rules are important. We don't use them as often. We don't use them as often. We certainly don't discuss them in law school, but you, you will end up using all of them in practice. Yep? I did have one question on the digital case. The um, defendants, I think, filed a motion for reconsideration. Yep. Can you just do that whenever or anything? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my personal thoughts on motions for reconsideration are they're completely useless. Okay, I work with some lawyers who feel that you need to ask them to reconsider everything. And in all my years, the only thing that happens with motions for reconsideration is you point out some of the flaws in the logic in the, the initial decision, if there are any, and the reconsideration decision then papers over those problems and makes it even less likely to be appealable. Okay. 
and, and this is, and I really want to caution you on this because I, I think it's I think it's a complete waste of time for the most part. And so there will be there I I, I no, there, there will be. I work with lawyers sometimes who, who ask for reconsideration on everything. Why? Right? If it's a reasoned decision and I thought about it and I've laid out the, the, the merits, you really think I'm gonna change my mind? And and that's that's the point is what's the likelihood? And the fact is, if you've got flaws with the decision, pointing them out is more likely going to fix them than potentially taking the issue on appeal if you really think you've got a good issue. What you hope, it's a prayer of desperate souls. What you're hoping is that they'll reverse themselves. Honest to God, and I've worked with lawyers who have filed in excess of 50, 70 in my work with them, maybe, maybe even 100, maybe even 100, because even to reconsider your reconsider position. Um, honest to God, I've never seen, I've never ever seen one change anything on a substantive basis. Not, not to help us, none of them, none of them have ever helped us. And so to me it's just, you're just wasting time. Move on with it, go to the next stage, just keep pushing. And that's, yeah, that's the last thing, that's the last advice I will give you that was given to me early on. When you're, if you are the plaintiff, you put blinders on and you march to trial. That's how civil cases get settled. You don't worry about the side issues. You don't think about, okay, we'll take our time, we'll do this or that. You want to resolve the case. Most civil cases, if they're going to settle, are going to settle within 30 days of that trial date. That's, that's the nature of it, because now the defendant has maxed out their fees. It's now time to roll up your sleeves and go to work. Um, and the defendant, and listen, from the standpoint of defending, their job is to stall, hinder, and delay. Every day they keep the dollars in their pocket is a victory. And so that's their job, is to, to slow it down. Your job is to speed it up. And, and that's the way, if you're going to litigate, that's, I think that's the best advice I've ever gotten in my entire life, is from some standpoint of litigating, is you just march to trial. And I'll give you a courtesy extension, but, you know, and I'll even extend some deadlines as long as it's not going to change the trial date, as long as the trial date stays the same. Because that's the day where, where the rubber hits the road and people have to decide, you really want to try, you really want to try it? Because I, I do, but, but, but that's the day where people will get serious about whether they're going to settle or try it. Either way, your client gets uh, closure more quickly. Obviously, they want closure to win, but I also feel you're more likely to win um, and win on good terms if you sort of, not sort of, if you take that very focused, narrow approach that the sooner the plaintiff gets to trial is almost always, always, 110% better uh, and the best course to proceed. So, maybe that advice as the last. See you.